in this unit of land and ocean use, it's now time to talk about our world's oceans and how we use our world's oceans. Unfortunately, most of us have knowledge about the ocean that's based on movies and TV shows, but we don't have the actual background information about what's really happening through the ecosystem of our oceans. So today we'll look at the oceans as a resource and how we use and exploit the world's oceans. First let's look at the overall trend of ocean use and taking a look at this graph we see that as time goes on more and more of the life is taken from the ocean but we do see a slight difference about how we get that life from the ocean there's two lines that you should be looking at and one of them is actually increasing and the other was increasing and has since leveled off and is now in somewhat of a decline so let's take a look at what we're looking at here the line that's increasing here is ocean production but through something called aquaculture all right and that's we're going to be talking about that in this lecture but you should know that what we're talking about are, are fish farms all right the farming of fish the darker blue line that was increasing for a long time through the 70s 80s and now into the 90s and the 2000s is on a decline that darker line is our fishing industry through fresh caught or the capturing of fish in the ocean. We're going to call that wild caught fish. Alright, so what we see is a difference between the aquaculture, the raising of fish, and what we actually pull out of the ocean itself, which is on a decline. So we see this difference here. So where are we going into the future? This is a growing industry, fish farming and aquaculture. So we have an increase in overall production, but more and more is coming from these fish farms. Is that good? Well, let's look at the oceans and how we use the oceans as a resource. And let's also take a look at fish farms. And at the end of this discussion, we can make a decision if we think fish farms is a possible solution or not. So let's take a look at this map and what we're looking at is our fisheries and the regions that have been overfished uh, throughout history. The top map is from 1950 and the bottom map is from 2005 and if we look at overall how we use our oceans we see some general concerns. In 1950 the areas that were overfished were basically your Scandinavian countries, uh, northern Europe, but if we look at today, the overfished areas have grown dramatically. All right, so you're seeing this big area off the coast of South America. We still see a problem in Northern Europe. But look at Southeast Asia. Cultures down here are so dependent on fish, and there's so many people, that our oceans are being stressed by the growth of the human population. All right, the extreme red what you're looking at are the extremely overfished areas and statistically right now a study just came out in Nature a prominent publication of science uh, there's a big decline in large predatory fish caught over the past 50 years so we're seeing the life of the ocean the ecosystem deteriorating right the trophic levels are breaking down and another study, a separate study shows that 30% of fisheries, and fisheries are those locations in the world where we go to fish, 30% of fisheries worldwide have seen a drop in 90% of the fish. Right, and we, we call that something. That's called a fishery collapse. So we're having major problems of keeping the populations of fish up and that becomes a concern for the ecosystem of our world's oceans. All right, the main reason for the problem is because we call the open oceans something called a common. Uh, they're owned by no one, but shared by everyone. And if we're going to excel economically, we see what's called the tragedy of the commons, where this concept of first come, first served dominates, 
you go out and you get as much as you can as quickly as you can and then you make the most money so we're seeing the tragedy of the commons in our fishing industry all these countries are going out to the open oceans they're overfishing they're getting as much as they can as quickly as they can and we're seeing fishery collapse all around the world why are we doing this why is this happening if we look at the technology technology of the fishing industry has gotten so big we no longer have fishing boats we now have factory ships where these ships will go out for six months at a time and they'll harvest the fish they'll pull them out of the ocean and they'll basically manage the whole production line all the way to putting the fish in a box ready for distribution right on the ship so the whole process goes on right on these big giant factory ships right all the way from fishing to production to basically putting it on ice six months later these ships pull back into port and the fish is already ready to distribute to our stores so because of the technology our fishing industry has become so good you, you can easily see that it'd be easy to overfish areas of the ocean the other problem is how we get fish there's basically four techniques and each one has their problems so let's go through them together the four techniques are trawling, uh, the gill net, the purse seine net, and long line. Those are the techniques. Let's go through each one of them together. And we'll start here with trawling. And trawling is taking a large net and dragging it across the bottom of the ocean with the net wide open and scooping up as many fish as you possibly can. Very simple to understand but hopefully you can already see some of the problems that are going to come from this procedure. This is used a lot for shrimp in the shrimping industry. Flounder, a lot of our ground fish, is caught this way. The problem is there's tons of ecosystem destruction. As you drag this net across the bottom of the ocean, which is going to destroy any plant life, any of the ecosystem that's on the ground right it stirs up tremendous amounts of sediment that sediment can get into our coral reefs it could clog fish it could kill other types of life so very destructive is is trawling although it's very effective you can pull up tons and tons of fish at one time lots and lots of fish and if you look at this picture uh, what you're looking at is the bottom of the net it scooped up so much fish that the sheer weight of all the fish in the net actually made the fish at the bottom of the net basically explode they explode out the bottom of the net they're crushed by their own weight so it's it's something to think about second technique of fishing is called a long line and a long line is easy to understand it's the idea of a regular hook and bait but not one hook and bait you have thousands and you can string this long line across the ocean let it go and it floats there by a series of buoys and you can let it go out there a day or two and then you come back after a couple days and pull in your catch alright here you go there's some fish that got caught using the long line third technique is called the gill net or the drift net and these nets are put out in the middle of the night and similar to the long line you stretch it across a region of the ocean and you use buoys to kind of let it float there the idea is to put it about 30 feet underwater and this net will stretch out and the fish will come swimming through they can't see it you put it out in the middle of the night and they'll come through and they get stuck in the net this technique is pretty much illegal around the world at this point we've decided to ban these they're horribly destructive because they catch basically anything that swims near them if you're fishing for a certain type of fish you don't want to catch non-targeted species but if you stretch a net out that fish can't see the, it'll catch basically anything you get a lot of non-targeted fish in this technique and we call that non-targeted non fish bycatch so for example sharks uh, turtles and porpoises even birds will come down and get snagged in these things um, 
Here's a picture, and you can see the thin, fibrous material, the net. Imagine that being out at night. Fish can't see that, and they get tangled in there. Even birds come down and get snagged on these. They're diving down into the water to get food, and they don't see the net, and they get caught and drowned. The fourth fishing technique is called a purse seine net. The idea is that there's a large net. A boat will basically float in a circle to set it up. You put the net down and then you pull the bottom closed which traps the fish. So it's almost like you're creating a little purse to, to capture the fish. This technique is used for a specific purpose which has something to do with dolphins. All right, what we found was a relationship between dolphins and another type of fish. When you see dolphins at the surface in pods swimming most likely there's a large number of tuna swimming under them. So we've seen this relationship. So if you're out looking for tuna, what you want to do is look for dolphins swimming on the surface. So it's an easy way to find large number of tuna in schools. Alright, so if you see dolphins at the surface, there's probably a large school of tuna swimming underneath them. All right, we're talking about the tuna that you eat in tuna fish. So to catch the tuna, we use purseine nets. And this is how it's done. What we're going to do is we're going to chase the dolphins. And we're going to tire those dolphins. The dolphins will stop and go into what's called a defensive posture, where they stop moving. The females and the young will go into the center, and the males will encircle them to protect them. The tuna is pretty dumb, so it swims in circles below the dolphins, and all we have to do is, once we have the dolphins in this defensive posture, is then take our boat, encircle the dolphins with the net, wrap it around the dolphins, close the bottom, and trap the tuna. So now you're talking 3,000 tuna all at one time. So it's very effective to do it this way. And then you pull your net in. The problem is there's still dolphins in that net. So you caught the tuna, but you've also caught dolphins. And when the net is pulled into the boat, now think about reeling in a fishing line. If you've ever reeled in a fishing line and there's a bobber on your line, think of a bobber on your fishing line. When you start pulling that in in the water, the bobber, from the force of being pulled in, the bobber will actually go underwater as long as you're reeling in the line. The bobber goes underwater. The same thing happens with the Persane net. When the net is being pulled in, the entire net, from the force of being pulled in, will go underwater a little bit. The problem is dolphins are mammals. They need oxygen to breathe. So as you pull this net in, the tuna is fine. It's a fish. But the dolphins will basically drown. So that's why we see dolphin safe labels on tuna fish. Those are companies who are working to reduce the mortality rate of dolphins. It doesn't necessarily mean that the tuna is dolphin safe, but those companies are at least working to reduce the mortality rate of dolphins. Okay, th and this has gone on for years. You're talking millions of dolphins over the years killed to catch tuna for the tuna industry. So the catching of dolphins or other non-targeted species is called bycatch. Alright, and here you go. Here's a picture of bycatch. The fishing industry is trying to catch something. The question is, what? So, look closely. You will see a couple of shrimp. This picture is from a shrimping boat. And in here you'll see the intended catch. Everything else is bycatch, which is then thrown back into the ocean, dead. Anything that's caught inadvertently in the net is considered bycatch. 
the shrimp nets are usually trawling nets, which is a real serious problem. It is the worst bycatch of all is the shrimp industry. 84% of all the catch in the shrimp industry is bycatch. So if you think about it, in the shrimp industry, it's only 16% effective. Everything else is totally destructive. Everything else is bycatch. All right, so overall, the fishing industry itself has about one third of its catch is bycatch, and two thirds is the targeted species. But if you're concerned about bycatch, which you should be, the worst by far is the shrimp industry. All right, here's a picture of a boat, a shrimping boat, uh, with a trawling net and you see it's catch down there there's a lot of shrimp in there and just to kind of point out the shrimp here's the shrimp and all the rest of that fish is unintended catch or bycatch all right bycatch can be anything anything that's inadvertently caught that wasn't targeted we see some of our endangered species being caught as bycatch and if you look at this pie chart here this kind of puts things into perspective. Here's your trawling nets in the shrimp industry. And of all the bycatch, if you look here, the biggest chunk is the shrimping industry, which uses those trawling nets. All right, here's uh, the per seine net. It might be a small number, but most of that is all dolphin. All right, and then long line is a big chunk. And there's some other types of techniques in here. Here's the hook and line is a big chunk. But take the trawling nets. Let's let's include shrimp. But take trawling nets. You have most of our bycatch. Over 70% of all bycatch is using trawling nets. So that's one of the reasons why trawling nets are so destructive. Not only does it uh, hurt the ecosystem, stir up sediment, destroy the bottom of the surface, but it also catches a tremendous amount of bycatch. Alright, so now we decided that if the oceans are being depleted and bycatch is a problem, we need some solutions. So one solution is aquaculture. The idea of farming aquatic species like fish, salmon, can be shellfish, like scallops, mussels, uh, we even use these for seaweed. The idea is to farm these species and that might be a solution to overfishing our world's oceans and catching non-targeted species and so forth. So here we have a salmon farm where we're raising salmon in captivity to breed them for food purposes. So we basically set up a net and keep the species in the natural environment so we use a cove or a bay you know, somewhere that's protected from the weather. So we set up nets and then raise the fish in large numbers in small areas. You can do this inland as well. All right, so we'll see these fish farms inland as well. But most are done on shorelines uh, in bays and coves and so forth. All right, so let's go back to this graph that we started with. So the line for aquaculture is increasing to make up for the loss of the naturally caught, which is decreasing. So we're starting to see fish in grocery stores being farm raised. Is that good? Let's think about this and wonder if this is a real solution. All right, so let's take a look at fish farms and their environmental consequences. Number one, environmental consequence whenever you have large populations of a species in a small area it's always susceptible to diseases okay so to combat that fish farmers include antibiotics in the fish food so they feed the fish antibiotics to combat the the problem of disease within their populations so we end up with antibiotics in the fish you can't have that many fish in such a small area without a severe chance of spreading disease. So they put it in the food, it goes into the fish, any excess antibiotics goes into the environment. So it goes into our rivers, our bays, our oceans, etc. Some of those antibiotics stay in the fish. We eat that meat, 
so we end up eating those antibiotics. So that becomes one of the consequences of fish farming. Antibiotics in our waterways and in our food. A second environmental consequence, whenever you have a large population in a small area, there's a problem with waste. All right, think about the amount of waste thousands of fish in a small area are going to produce. That waste can be collected and we don't know what to do with it, so one of our solutions to the waste problem, the solution to pollution is dilution. We take that waste and we throw it into the ocean, especially the farms that are in bays and coves and on shorelines. It's very easy to just throw it into the ocean. The solution to pollution is dilution. Now taking that waste and throwing it into the ocean, you're adding nutrients into a system that's delicately balanced. So now you have nutrient pollution, you have bacteria in the feces of the fish that's being added to ocean ecosystems, so that's a problem. You could also have large amounts of waste that isn't collected and actually, actually leaches into our waterways where we have these fish farms. So the waste leads to nutrient pollution and those nutrients we're talking about you know the nitrogens that are in waste so eutrophication becomes a problem but we're also talking about bacteria in the feces all going into the environment. Okay, so the waste is a huge problem when it comes to these fish farms. Third problem or environmental consequence of fish farms is one that we don't really think about and it's escape. When a farm raised species escapes, there's basically two problems that can occur that fish can begin to compete for food sources with native species. So the ecosystem itself now, has, now is experiencing competition and that's going to lead to a decrease of population. The other problem with escape of farm-raised species is when they escape they're free to breed with wild fish. Let's take the example of a salmon. A farm-raised salmon escapes from a fish farm and interbreeds with a native salmon. The offspring, let's say the offspring is a female, because it's the offspring of a farm-raised fish, it might not have the same instincts as a native fish. So a salmon whose instincts tell them they have to return to native breeding grounds of small creeks up in mountains a farm-raised fish might not have those instincts or the offspring of a farm-raised fish might not have those instincts it doesn't know to go to a native breeding ground upstream in mountains because it's never been there its ancestors have never been there so what happens is they stay in the ocean and they lay their eggs there and there's so many predators of the salmon that the eggs get eaten it's one of the reasons why salmon swim upstream because it's an adaptation for survival all right, so interbreeding of species that escaped fish farms may have a negative environmental consequence uh, when it comes to certain species. So looking at these environmental consequences and considering fish farms, are fish farms the answer to our problem of overfishing and bycatch and destruction of the ocean ecosystem? through our techniques it's it's a tough call in many cases you want to avoid farm raised fish because of the concerns for antibiotics disease and what's going into our bodies but we should also be concerned about the problem of bycatch and depleting the world's oceans now if you know a fish is in decline and you want to eat that fish then farm raised fish might be a better choice Things like tuna and shrimp, fish farms might be a better choice as well, but there's always that concern of what's in the meat, the antibiotics, and you know if you're concerned about the oceans as an environment, the waste, it, it's a tough call. The best choice would be 
uh, a species that's not endangered, the numbers are not in decline, and they're caught in the wild by techniques that don't create a lot of bycatch or ecosystem destruction. The best choice is always native fish that are not in decline. That's what we should be choosing as a consumer. But that's not always easy to find out or know, so we need to do our homework and be better citizens when it comes to being a consumer of fish or fish products. A few things happened that you should know about when it comes to our fisheries. The first thing was in 1996, Congress passed the Sustainable Fisheries Act. This took management of the fisheries off the economic concerns and made managers work more on the conservation side of things. So they were more aware now by law of the ecological and environmental impacts of the industry. They took into consideration species sustainability, conservation, and preservation of species, and any critical marine habitats that are important for both commercial and non-targeted species had to be protected until populations recovered. So this law put a concern onto uh, the environmental and ecological impacts of the fishing industry. And if you think about it, 1996 wasn't that long ago. So this piece of legislation is just starting to make a difference. So now, under the Sustainable Fisheries Act, we can now take a part of the ocean and make it illegal to fish until populations recover beyond critical status. So if we know there's a critical marine habitat that's important for both commercial species and non-targeted species, they have to be protected. All right. The other thing that was a little bit earlier than that was in 1973, it was called the Individual Transferable Quota. All right, ITQs. The Individual Transferable Quotas, before each salmon season, fishing managers can establish, based on their knowledge, what the maximum sustainable yield is. All right, how many fish can you catch without hurting the ecosystem? And this is used especially in Alaska, among other places. But now, fishery managers can establish a total allowable catch of all species. Okay, in a previous lecture we talked about that maximum sustainable yield. How many fish can you take out of a fishery, out of a native fishery, without hurting the ecosystem, without hurting the population? They figure out that number and then they, they say that's how many fish. That's their quota. So then they sell or distribute quotas to individual fishermen. So for example, let's say you come up with 200,000 tons of cod can be caught. So you have 200,000 tons of cod quotas to be distributed between all of the fishermen. So the fishermen buy those quotas depending on how much they think they can catch and then that's the amount of fish that can be taken out of a specific fishery. If the fisherman catches less than their quota and they have extra quotas, they can sell those quotas or continue to try and catch more. But the important thing is that there's only a certain amount of fish that can be caught in any one commercial fishery. All right, once all those quotas are sold out, nobody else is allowed to fish there. It becomes illegal. These two ideas have made a significant difference especially in the salmon harvest in Alaska. The salmon harvest was in decline from the 1940s all the way through the 1970s until they started these individual transferable quotas. Ever since that, the salmon has been on an increase. All right, so our case study is the Alaskan salmon. Since these went into effect, the salmon population has rebounded in fact, it's, it's above where it's ever been since they've been measuring the population of salmon. So the individual transferable quota system seems to be a great way of trying to maintain sustainable fishing. We have a lot of work to do in our oceans. The number of people 
on the planet is growing, especially in countries that a main part of their diet is based on fish. So we have lots of worries and lots to consider when we think about our fisheries. So hopefully this gives you a little perspective and a little of an idea of what is happening so that you can go out and tell your friends the real truth about what's happening in our oceans and more importantly hopefully this gives you a little bit of perspective on the issues around our fishing industry so that you can make better decisions as a consumer of fish and fish products because we are the ones that make a difference it's the consumers that have all the power we drive the decisions of industries and it's important for us to be aware and be knowledgeable about topics like this so that we can make the right choices we can make the right decisions and that is one of the bigger voices and influences that we can have so thank you and bring food for thought and discussion to class